of course. I forgot. I was thinking it was Central Time, and she's in Pennsylvania. So it, it turned out to be kind of interesting. It's a much kinder, softer, easier, gentler approach to also true than you, most people find. But she was Catholic, so it was kind of interesting discussing it with her. I mean, it was really, it was really a challenge, but uh, I think I did pretty good with it. So what do you think? Are we ready? Okay. So today we're going to talk about the Reagan's Mall. The Reagan's Mall is the story of um, the beginning of this legend of Sigurd the Dragon Slayer. And it starts off, there's some very interesting stuff. Now, if you look at the way the poem was formed, you'll see that it's, that there's, several there's two different types of stanzas in it there's several different you know obviously from different stories but the the legend comes out because there's a there's an underlying meaning to everything that's going on here just about every sentence every word has a has a has an effect on on what it means to read this so when we start, we start with Sigurd went to Hjalprek's stud and chose for himself a horse who thereafter was called Granny. At that time, Regan, the son of Hrythmar, was come to Hjalprek's home. He was more ingenious than all other men and a dwarf in stature. He was wise, fierce, and skilled in magic. So this is a threatening individual. He's a short man, probably has Napoleon kind of complex. But that he's smarter than other men He's short, wise, fierce, and skilled in magic. So this is supposed to be someone that everyone's supposed to kind of respect automatically because he's been around for a while. But as we see, as we get later on down the story, he's not that wise. He's not that fierce. And his skill in magic isn't quite what they say it is. So this is a man, a short man, full of egotistical drive <clears throat> that he expects everyone to pay attention to him. Right, because he is supposed to be wise, fierce, and skilled in magic. And I see that same kind of mentality, though we don't see any proof of that in the beginning. We just have hearsay. Okay. Reagan undertook Sigurd's bringing up and teaching and loved him much. Okay, so this man took under his wing Sigurd, and this is not an uncommon thing. He told Sigurd of his forefathers and also of this that once Odin, Honir, and Loki had come to Andvari's waterfall, and in the fall were many fish. Andvari was a dwarf who had dwelt long in the waterfall in the shape of a pike, and there he got his food. Otter was the name of a brother of ours, said Regan, who went off into the, into the fall in the shape of an otter. He had caught a salmon and sat on the high bank eating it with his eyes shut. <coughs> so in those couple of sentences, there's an important structure to what's happening here. You have this short man who, is re, re, who has this aura about him of wisdom and fierce and skilled and magic, and he takes Sigurd. And the first thing he begins to do in his teaching of Sigurd is sharing this thing that happened to him a long time ago, this thing that festers in his very spirit. His, there's a resentment here. Okay, so he starts talking about these divine beings that show up at his home, at this waterfall, and they kill Otter, his brother. Otters are in just about every mythology around the world. They are these unique creatures that travel between land and water, and their fur is, is an amazing fur. I think a human has like 170 hairs per square centimeter or something like that. An otter has like 800. So it's a very warm fur. To have an otter fur cloak or, 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 or collar is, a, is an important thing. They're also smart. They travel in families. They're packs. They defend each other. They'll fight off enemies much greater than themselves. But the interesting thing is he caught this salmon. He's sitting on the high bank eating it with his eyes shut. Now, why would someone eat their food with their eyes shut? And the short answer in that is greed. He's so, he's so greedy that he cannot bear to see this salmon diminishing before him. So he's going to enjoy it 
with his eyes shut. He's going to have his cake and eat it too. That's greed. That is pure greed. Hey, Letitia. Oh, uh, yeah. How you doing? I'm good. Did I unmute myself? I'm sorry. That's okay. Hold on. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Well, shit. Sorry. <laughs> You're going to be famous for that. Apparently. So anyway, Loki threw a stone at him and killed him. And the gods thought that they had great good luck and stripped the skin off the otters. For that, the otter skin is a treasure, especially up north. The sea otter is one of the warmest furs, waterproof, all that wonderful stuff. But they're not a very big creature, so it takes a lot of them to make a cloak. That same evening, they sought a knight's lodging at Hrythmar's house and showed their booty, which is hilarious to me. But then we seized them and told them as ransom for their lives to fill the otter skin with gold and completely cover it outside as well with red gold. Now, if you go to someone's home and they're a divine being and you grab a hold of them, this is Odin, Honir, and Loki. Don't we think for one second that they could simply be don't lay hands on me, but just kill him and take it all. But there's there's a demonstration there of the responsibilities of being a good guest. Hospitality is something that we always talk about, but that's a two-way street. If you're in someone's home and you're a guest, there are responsibilities that go with that. There's an expectation. We're going to show you this hospitality, but you're going to act right. So they're demonstrating that very important quality of being a good guest and Hey, we're going to live up to our obligation here. This is a wrong we've done to you, and we're going to take care of it. So Odin and Honir, they send Loki to get the gold. So they're going to cover that otter skin with gold. He went to Ran and got her net and went to Anvari's fall and cast the net in front of the pike, and the pike leaped into the net. Then Loki said, what is the fish that runs in the flood and itself from ill cannot save? If thou head, wouldst thou from hell redeem, find me the water's flame. So the water's flame is gold because um, Eager was, was wont to light his underwater home or his underwater palace with gold. Okay, the, but there's some interesting notes here about this first, first setup. Um, Reagan's name means council giver. And undoubtedly, he goes back to the Smith of the German story. In the Thitzgrit saga version, he is called Mimir, while Reagan is there the name of the dragon. So there's a switch there. Okay. <clears throat> In the Voluspa Sands 12, names Reagan among the dwarves. And the name may have assisted in making Reagan a dwarf here. Prythmar, knowing nothing is known of him outside of this story. So this is the only place he shows up. Okay. And Vari's fall, according to Snorri, who tells this entire story in the Skald's Karpramal, and Vari's fall was in the world of the Dark Elves, while the one when Loki killed the otter was not. Here, however, the two are considered identical. With his eyes shut, according to Snorri, Otter ate with his eyes shut because he was so greedy that he could not bear to see the food before him diminishing. Ran is the wife of the sea god, Aegir, who draws down drowning men with her net. Okay. So there's, so there's obviously greed. There's a, there's a greedy aspect to dwarves that we see in, in much of the lore uh, with Kivasir uh, and, and several other things, especially with the, with the gifts that, uh, that Loki presents to the uh, gods for the, for the kidnapping, or for the rape of Sif. And Vari spoke, and Vari am I, and Oin my father, in many a fall have I fared, and evil Norn in olden days doomed me in waters to dwell. So he's been cursed as well. So he's probably not the most mentally stable individual to be dealing with. Loki spake, and Avari say, if thou seekest still to live in the land of men, what payment is set for the sons of men who war with lying words? A mighty payment the men must make, who in Vathgilmer's waters wait on a long road lead the lying words that one to another utters. So right there, they're talking about, they're, they're trying to establish this idea that if you're going to be dealing with me, you're going to be honest about it, which is a really weird thing coming from a, 
a being that's been cursed by an evil norn and this deceitful one and the, the chief deceiver and backbiter of the gods. They're talking about what it really costs to be a deceitful person in the world of men. What is it really going to cost you to be a dishonest individual, to be deceitful and still have to do it? It's a long road, lead the lying words that one to another utters. It makes life difficult. Honesty as part of the nine noble virtues is one of those very important virtues, not only with regards to dealing with each other. So we have a second idea of dealing with, with of how people interact with each other. One is with honesty. And the first one, as we saw, was with, was with hospitality and being a guest. <clears throat> so now we're talking about being honest as men to each other because it's a long road, lead the lying words. Life is tough. If you start being dishonest with others, it creates a lot of chaos. But when you start being dishonest with yourself and you're not honest about what you're doing or what you're saying or how you're acting, life becomes a struggle. Loki saw all the gold that Anvari had, but when he brought forth all the gold, he held back one ring. And Loki took this from him. The dwarf went into his rocky hole and said, Now shall the gold that Gust once had bring their death to brothers twain. And evil be for heroes eight. Joy of my wealth shall no man win. So he put a curse on it that pretty much covers it all. If, if no brothers are going to enjoy that. Now, I don't know if he's, this is kind of your, your, uh, your uh, forecasting of what's fixing to happen between these brothers of Hrythmar, these sons of Hrythmar, Regan and Fafnir. And it would be eight heroes have to go through this gold before the curse is lifted. The gods gave Hrythmir the gold and filled up the otter skin and stood on its feet. Then the gods had to heap up gold and hide it. And when that was done, Hrythmir came forward and saw a single whisker and bade them cover it. Now otter fur, as we remember, is a very dense fur, you know, 800 hairs per square centimeter or something along that. So it's a dense fur. It's going to take a lot of gold to cover all that up. There's one whisker sticking out and he told him to cover it. Then Othan brought out the ring and Verna and covered the hair. Then Loki said, the gold is given and great the price thou hast my head to save. So Gust is probably a name for Anvari himself or an earlier possessor of the treasure. The brothers Train are Fafnir and Regan, heroes eight. The word eight may easily have been substituted for something like all just to make the stanza fit. <laughs> the eight in question are presumably Sigurd, Gothorm, Gunnar, Hogni, Otli, Erp, Sorli, and Hamther, all of whom are slain in the course of the story. So he names all the individuals. All of these heroes get a taste of that gold and they all die. Okay. But fortune, thy sons shall not find there. The bane of ye both it is. So Loki tells him, hey, you guys got all this, but it's fixing to mess up your world. Brythmar spake, gifts ye gave, but ye gave not kindly. Gave not with hearts that were whole. Your lives are this, ye, should ye all have lost, if sooner this fate had I seen. So Hrythmar gets upset. He's like, hey, you did something wrong. You've given all this, and now you're going to throw a curse on me? We should have ended your life to begin with it. Loki answers. Now, this is, this is the chief deceiver. This is the uninspired human intellect. This is the one individual who has a seat at the table who simply cannot demonstrate what it means to be at that table, who cannot grow into the being that's worthy of sitting and, and feasting with the gods. Yet here he is, and Hrythmar is beginning to upset him. Worse is this, Loki spake, worse is this that methinks I see, for a maid shall kinsmen clash. Heroes unborn thereby shall be, I deem, to hatred doomed. So for a maid shall kinsmen clash. This is Brunhilda. So she's already being talked about. Loki's already seeing this. So he's not only cursing them with gold. Now all of a sudden they're going to fight over women too. So there's no, if, you, if you're poor and you're happy with someone, you can enjoy a good life. But if you have no wealth and no good relationship, it's a sad state of affairs for most men. And indeed, there's a lot of very lonely individuals out here dealing with that kind of thing because 
they can't get past what the uninspired human intellect has put on them. We see a lot of people today who can't get past those things that prevent them from being honest with themselves, being generous as a guest, being honest with themselves about those things they need to set to the side or get rid of so they can become something more and maybe enjoy true companionship and love. There's a real depth in just this first part that I think a lot of people miss. We just see in a wonderful story here. There's a curse and a treasure. <laughs> okay. Reithmar spake, the gold so red shall I rule me think so long as I shall live. Not a fear for thy threats I feel, so get ye against to their home. So he's like, hey, I got the gold. Y'all need to get out and quit running your mouths. Okay. But that's not how it works. The, the curse immediately takes effect. Fafnir and Reagan asked Hrythmar for a share of the wealth that was paid for the slaying of their brother. Like every inheritance that comes along, brothers begin to argue about it. This he refused, and Fafnir thrust his sword through the body of his father Hrythmar while he was sleeping. Hrythmar called to his daughters. Laganheath and Lofenheath fled as my life and mighty now is my need. Lagan Heath spoke, though a sister loses her father, seldom revenge on her brother she brings. Brathmar spake, a daughter, a woman with a wolf's heart, bear if thou hast no son with the hero brave. If one weds the maid, for the need is mighty, their son for thy hurt may vengeance seek. <coughs> so the daughter tells Rathmir, there's nothing I can do against my brothers. These men are, are vicious animals, they've killed their father. What can a woman do? What can a daughter do to take care of this pain that her brothers have caused her? Well, Hrythmir ensures that that poisonous state of mind, of, of gold, of greed, that we see otter. So the greed is first demonstrated by otter eating the salmon with his eyes closed. So we already see we're dealing with a family that is generally ruled by greed. But greed is one of those miserable states of existence. So Hrythmir's dying. So he takes his daughter, and what does he do? He does his best to ensure that that state of mind, that poison, the idea that misery loves company, continues on to his grandsons. So he does his best to instill in his daughters a hatred for what's happened, a pain, one of those lasting resentments that people tend to carry with them for a long time. And then when their children come into the world, what kind of stories do they tell their children? They tell their children of how they were wronged, how they were a victim. That, that continues on down. And we see it kind of going on down now with people that are, are ensuring that their child understands what they hate, what they dislike, what they, why they are a victim, how they've been wronged, the young child will absorb that. So here we see Hrythmar ensuring that the state that he created with his family, with greed of selfishness, of, of a complete disrespect and a refusal of the, of the divine into their home, it's being carried on through the next generation, even though he's not going to be there. Then Hrythmir died and Fafnir took all the gold, right? Thereupon, Reagan asked to ha have his inheritance from his father, but Fafnir refused this. Then Reagan asked counsel of Ligonheath, his sister, how should he win his inheritance, she said. In friendly wise, the wealth shalt thou ask of thy brother in better will. Not seemly it is to seek with the sword Fafnir's treasure to take. So, <laughs> if we look at how Hrythmir told his daughter to carry that kind of greedy, selfish, I'm a victim curse onto his grandson, Reagan's doing the same thing with cigarettes. One day when he came to Reagan's house, he was gladly welcomed. Reagan said, Hither the son of Sigmund is come, the hero eager to hear to our hall. His courage is more than an ancient man's, and battle I hope from the hardy wolf. Here shall I foster the fearless prince. Now Yngwie's hair to us is come, the noblest hero beneath the sun. The threads of his fate all lands in fold. So Reagan's sister told him, look, don't be going up there trying to match swords with him because you can't do it. So his skill in the warrior is brought into doubt. 
he was introduced as wise and fierce and skilled in magic. All of that means nothing because his sister said, don't go up against Fafra. You can't do it. So he's got to find somebody better. And when you find somebody better, how best will you capitalize on that individual's abilities? While well, you're going to instill in them those same resentments, pains, and victim ideas that you carry. And this is what he's doing to Sigurd. He's blowing him up, telling him how great he is. And then he's telling him he's making, he's creating that idea that that kind of perception of affection and lacing the entire thing with poison. I'm a, I love you so much. You're a great hero, blah, blah, blowing smoke up his ass and then fills him with that poison that he can't do anything about. Sigurd was there continually with Reagan, who said to Sigurd that Fafnir lay at Nidahith and was in the shape of a dragon. He had a fear helm, of which all living creatures were terrified. Reagan made Sigurd the sword, which was called Gram. It was so sharp that when he thrust it down into the Rhine and let a strand of wool drift against it with the stream, it cleft the strand asunder as if it were water. And with this sword, Sigurd cleft asunder Reagan's anvil. After that, Reagan egged Sigurd on to slay Fafnir, but he said, Loud will the sons of Hunding laugh. Who loaded Ilimi lay in death if the hero sooner seeks the red rings to find than his father's vengeance? So we have one glimmer of honor and integrity that shows up from Sigurd right there. So they forged the sword. Sigurd has his own ideas too. He's seeking vengeance for the death of his father. But Reagan's kind of trying to push him. Hey, you need to take care of this, man. I've spent a lot of time training you, teaching you, helping you forge this sword. Now it's ready. We need to go get that gold. And Sigurd has enough character to say, wait a minute. There's a bunch of people out here. And according to our laws and our ways, vengeance is mine. I will take vengeance on those who wrongly killed my father first. I will not be the butt of a joke simply because to satisfy you. So he's kind of standing up and becoming a man in this thing. And an interesting ha thing happens when he stands up to take care of his responsibilities of honor <coughs> and becoming a man of his own. King Halpert gave Sigurd a fleet for the avenging of his father, and they ran into a great storm and were off a certain headland. A man stood on the mountain and said, Who yonder rides on ravial steeds over towering waves and waters wild? The sail horses all with sweat are dripping, nor can the sea steeds the gale withstand. So when Sigurd begins to take action as a man, right there in that time of trouble, in that stormy sea, in that storm, he finds divine, he finds a divine interaction. When we begin to take care of the things that are our responsibility, we find within ourselves those things we need to take care of what needs to happen. We can count on that kind of divine support. It is a part of who we are. Now, Reagan answered, On the sea trees here are Sigurd and I. The storm wind drives us on to our death. The waves crash down on the forward deck and the roller steeds sink. Who seeks our names? So, so in the middle of that storm, what we have here is this Reagan talking about, remember he was introduced as wise, skill, fierce and skilled in magic and ingenious. He's terrified, his knees are shaking. He's, he's quaking in his boots. We begin to see that not only has he instilled in Sigurd all of the same kind of selfish, greedy ideas that he was raised with, now all of a sudden we see he's a coward as well. And as Sigurd is moving forward to take care of the vengeance that is his and, and act in, the, in an honorable fashion, he gets a, a divine interaction with Odin himself. The man spake, Niker I was when Volson once gladdened the ravens and battle gave, called me the man from the mountain now. Fing or Fjolnir, with you will I fare. They sailed to the land and the man went on board the ship and the storm subsided. Sigurd spake, Niker say, for thou seest the fate that to gods and men is given. What sign is fairest for him who fights and best for the swinging of swords? 
So Segrith is continuing on. He's looking for that edge that's going to help him. And once he sees what he's got going on here, once he sees he's got this kind of divine interaction, he seeks that wisdom to make sure that he's going to be successful. Knocker spake, many of the signs of men but new that are good for the swinging of swords. It is well, me think, if the warrior meets a raven black on the road. We have a good sign there. There's a raven on the way. So if you see a raven on the road, that's a good sign. Another it is, if thou art come, the art ready forth to fare. So you got to be prepared. You got to train yourself. You can't just walk out there and expect to be victorious. You have to stay in condition. You have to prepare yourself for whatever battles in front of you. <laughs> to behold on the path before thy house, two fighters greedy of fame. So if you go ready to leave your house, you come across two Joes that are out there seeking to make a name for themselves by taking a, sh a shot at the guy on top, there's a pretty clear indication that you are the man to contend with. So if you look around, you see all throughout Heathen, you see the people that are on top and you always see all these other people taking pot shots and sniping at them. That's a pretty good sign you're on top of your game. So if you go to fair from your house and there's two guys that they're gonna make a name for themselves by taking you down, pretty clear indication you're you're the you're the man and it's probably going to be successful because you've spent that time to train yourself to prepare yourself to be the one that everyone else has to kind of deal with in order to become something better every time you see someone engaging in that polite character assassination around the water cooler they're trying to take a pot shot at the individual that's on top every time you look through social media and you see someone make a snide vague book posting about someone that they don't like and aren't very clear about it, they're testing the waters to see if they can get away with kind of slandering that individual, making a name for themselves and move up. I'll call them out like I see it, which I think is awesome. Huh. Third, it is well a howling wolf thou hearest under the ash, and fortune comes if, thou, if thy foe thou seest, ere the hero beholds. You gotta see, you gotta be able to identify what you're up against before you get there. The howling wolf under the ash, the ash is the greatest of all trees, Yggdrasil. To hear that wolf howl while under Yggdrasil, you're at the great gallows of Odin where he sacrificed himself to himself. You're at that very sacral space, the axis mundi, the vertical connecting point between the roots down to the misty hell and all the wells all the way up through the, all the, way up through the, through the trunk and into the leaves, the axis mundi that connects the underworld with the, with the heavens. If you're in that place, you're probably pretty centered. You're probably pretty, you've got a well-rounded being. You're not completely committed to being a, a physical type of individual, nor are you completely committed to being that nerd. You're the golden mean of an individual, the intelligent, the physically fit, the emotionally stable. You're under the ash. Okay, to hear that wolf howl, now it's time to move forward. That's the sign that the moon, the, the moon is up, okay? Now, if you see your foe before he sees you, you've got the advantage of surprise. So there's a tactical idea there too. A man shall not fight when he must face the moon's bright sister setting light. You don't fight. You're not gonna go fight someone with the sun shining in your eyes. <laughs> when he shall who well can see the wedge-like forms his men for the fray. This is the spear formation that the Vikings used to great effect as they began to spread, spread out, build their empire. So there's two tactical ideas there. Don't fight with the sun shining in your eyes and use your army in a tactical formation. Foul is the sign if thy foot stumble, if thou goest forth to fight. Goddess is baneful at both thy sides, wilt thou wounds thou shalt get. So if you jump out there like John Wayne and the first thing you do is fall on your face, you might want to back up and regroup because life is hard and it's harder if you're stupid. And if you're stumbling out there because you're carrying a heavy load or there's too much in your mind or you can't get your feet underneath you, which is kind of the important thing, you've got to have your feet underneath you. Um, what kind of terrain are you standing on? Are you standing on solid ground or are you standing on a, a foundation that's an ever-shifting sand of this idea over here, or that idea over there, centered under the ash, on stable ground, move forward. Okay? Combed and washed shall the wise man go, and a meal at mom shall take. For unknown it is 
Where at eve he may be, it is ill by luck to lose. Take care of yourself. So now not only are you mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically prepared, you're, on, you're under the ash, you're on firm ground, now clean up. Go out in the world and show that you are, that you demonstrate that you are part of what you say you are. Sigurd had a great battle with Lingby, the son of Hunding, and his brothers, their Lingby fell, and two brothers with him. After the battle, Reagan said, now the bloody eagle with biting sword is carved on the back of Sigmund's killer. Few were more fierce in fight than his son, who reddened the earth and gladdened the ravens. Sigurd went home to Hjalprek's house, thereupon Reagan egged him, egged him on to fight with Fafnir. <laughs> so Odin conveys that well-rounded meaning of what it means to be a man, to be an individual that's going to go forward and be successful. There are some very powerful secrets to success in what was just shared with Sigurd as he went forward to take care of those duties, which were his responsibility. <clears throat> when you drift off of that, you've got a problem. So now Sigurd no longer really has a focus. Now he really no longer, he's already achieved it. Now where do you go from there? He spent his life preparing building, training, centering himself. He centered himself under the ash so much that he had that divine interaction in that moment of trouble that caused a lesser greedy man to quake in his boots for fear. So in that great tale, there's a lot more wisdom than people seem to understand. There's a principles of success involved in dealing with just about any of life's difficulties in just those couple of paragraphs. I'm trying to decide if I want to go on a Fafnir small because that's good. That's pretty in depth. We may continue that next week. But Sigurd went home to Yalprek's house. Thereupon Reagan egged him on to fight with Fafnir. So now all of this selfish, greedy, kind of um, self-absorbed idea of being a victim that Reagan's in that's Reagan's fed to Sigurd's mind for most of his life, all of his growing up. While he was training, Sigurd had two focuses. He had to focus to take care of his family business, which he did. And he did it on solid ground, well-centered, with divine support. Okay? But he's also had Reagan whispering in his ear. He has been the man, the 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 man whispering to the wounded individual at the edge of the crowd. So now Sigurd no longer has a drive or purpose or focus. And I think it behooves us to understand that when we have a goal, when we have drive, purpose, an idea, something to move forward towards, and we can utilize that wisdom that Odin gives to Sigurd, we can achieve that but it's very important that there be another goal behind that. See, because now Sigurd is without purpose or direction. Now he's kind of on his own. And you see that with people that win Olympic gold medals or the astronauts that have been to space or gone to the moon. After you've done something like that, now what do you do? Go sell cars? Well, that's not going to be very fulfilling. People that win the... One of the uh, OU quarterbacks now is working for a car dealership. What? I see, I see, I know people, I've seen them, you walk, they show up with a gigantic ring on their hands and they've got a Super Bowl ring. Now they're working in regular business. Most likely a millionaire, got a lot of money. Are they doing what they want to do? Or are they doing something because they can't, what do they do? Where do you go after you enjoy that kind of success? And this is very much where Sigurd is at. He has gone forward. He has made himself the man to handle and live up to his father's name. Now, where does he go? Well, he's going to backslide just a little bit. Now he's going to pay attention to this man that's kind of blowing smoke up his ass, pushing him forward to handle business that he can't take care of himself. And that's what brings us to the Fafnir small. <coughs> in 
the Ballad of Fafnir is an interesting, every bit as interesting as that one. So they have to come up with a plan. Sigurd and Regan went up to Niedehyth and found there the track that Fafnir made when he crawled to water. Then Sigurd made a great trench across the path and took his place therein. When Fafnir crawled from his gold, he blew out venom and it ran down from above on Sigurd's head. But when Fafnir crawled over the trench, then Sigurd thrust his sword into his body. So Fafnir was so greedy, he was denying himself. He'd become this great bloated beast that only came out of his cave or off his gold to take a drink of water. And probably had done so for a long time. Reagan didn't have what it take to match up to that, but Sigurd does. So in the ingenious manner, a guy that's put a lot of thought in how he's going to screw somebody else out of their treasure, he uses a, uh, an avatar. He sends Sigurd out there to take care of it for him. He doesn't, anybody could have laid in a trench and stabbed a dragon in the heart. Why couldn't Reagan dig that trench and lay there and stab him in the heart? Why did he have to have Sigurd do it? There's no heroism in hiding and jumping up behind a bush to slay a dragon. It's not like he went up to him and cut his head off. <laughs> Reagan could have done that. Reagan didn't have the courage to. He sent another man to do it for him. He whispered in his ear the entire time he grew up. And instead of going out to, to grab the treasure that he so dreamed of, he sent someone else to do it. That never works. Anytime you send somebody out to do something that you ought to be doing yourself, it's always going to come back on you. And we find that here. So Sigurd kills Fafnir. Fafnir writhed and struck out with his head and tail. Sigurd leaped from the trench and each looked at the other. And Fafnir said, Youth, O youth, of whom then youth art thou born? Who so say whose son thou art? who in Fafnir's blood thy bright blade reddened and struck thy sword to my heart. Sigurd concealed his name because it was believed in olden times that the word of a dying man might have great power if he cursed his foe by name. So right off the bat, Fafnir's sitting there going, what I, what I do to deserve this? What's this got to do with me? Why have you taken my life? Not as a sacrifice, not in a great challenge of combat, but in a sneaky ambush way. The noble heart, my name, and I go, a motherless man abroad. Father, I had not, as others have, the lonely ever I lived. So he's trying to make sure he doesn't get cursed. Little does he know there's already a curse on that gold. And Reagan knows it. Reagan knows full well what it is. Fafnir spake, if father thou hadst not, as others have, I wonder what wast thou born. Though thy name of the day of my death thou hidest, thou knowest now thou dost lie. No longer is Sigurd standing there as the honorable man that avenged his father's death. Now he's killed simply to kill on someone else's behalf. <coughs> and he should feel shame. My race methinks is unknown to thee, and so am I myself. Sigurd my name and Sigmund's son, who smote thee, thus with the sword. So he comes clean. He's got to be honest about it. And that's, that shows the character, the strength of character that, that Sigurd has. And we all too often, when we get caught in a lie or some kind of deception, or when we're acting on someone else's behalf, or in any of those compromising situations, more often than not, people will attempt to be dishonest about it. And that's a shame. But now here we have Sigurd, who once again shows what kind of a hero that he is, what kind of well-rounded individual he is, and tries to resume his place under the ash. He's taken a life that wasn't his to take. <laughs> but he stands up on both feet, so yes, I said it. This is who I am, and I'm the one that did it. He's got to deal with that. That takes courage. And more often than not, I see a lot of individuals that don't have the courage to say, yeah, I said it. And this is exactly why. Fafnir spake, what drove thee on? Why wert thou driven my life to make me lose? A father brave had the bright-eyed youth, for bold in boyhood thou art. 
Sigurd spake, my heart did drive me, my hand fulfilled and my shining sword so sharp. Few are keen when old age comes who timid in boyhood are. So he kind of points it out like it is, man. Fafnir spake, if thou mightest grow thy friends among, one might see thee fiercely fight, but bound thou art and in battle taken into fear are prisoners prone. So he, so a contest of insults is beginning. Sigurd had the courage to stand up and take it. Now he's going to have to take some abuse for this wrong action. You're, <coughs> if you're man enough to stand up and do it, <coughs> you better be man enough to stand up and deal with the consequences of it. So Sigurd said, Sigurd is acting on everything that Reagan's taught him for, for his entire life that he was a timid boy, that he really isn't worthy to have all this gold, that he's not much of a man. Now he's just a monstrous dragon. And Fafnir calls it like it says, says, look, man, you're acting like you're, you know, you're acting like a coward. Your friends are going to bind you. You're going to, you're going to be a coward in prison as a prisoner. There's a contest there going on. He's going to have to take those stings, those slings and arrows of lesser men. Sigurd spake, thou blamest me, Fafnir, that I see from afar, the wealth that my father's was, not bound am I, though in battle taken, thou hast found that free I live. So Sigurd is still acting on this, and this is just one of those cheap little comments that are, that denigrate the character of who he is. He calls Reagan as a father, and he steps up saying, look, I'm taking vengeance in my father's name for this wealth that my father's was. He deserved that, not you. But see, Sigurd is acting, he may not necessarily have known the whole story. He's only ever heard one side of it. And a lot of times, that's the way it is with us. We only ever hear one side of a story. And we'll take magnificent actions uh, based on the kind of righteous indignation we might feel because of what someone else told us. How do we move a faith forward if the majority of what we're doing is indulging in the righteous indignation because someone else is a victim. Someone else won't take actions necessary to grow. And we see that play out right here between Sigurd and Fafnir. Fafnir spake, in all I say dost thou hatred see. So Fafnir knows right there, ain't nothing I could say that you would listen to. Yet truth alone do I tell even though he's going to tell him the truth, the sounding gold, the glow red wealth, and the rings thy bane shall be. So he's telling him the truth. He said, listen here. You may have jumped in here like John Wayne because re what Reagan told you, but I promise you this is going to cause you to suffer. <laughs> How often do we listen to that cautionary tale when we go take action based on someone else's urging? When a soldier goes out to the battlefield, he dies believing he has fought for God and country and the protection of his family and the rights of individuals that do it. It takes an intense amount of mental conditioning to get a man to run towards the sound of gunfire. Our country is an expert at it. How many people have lost mothers and daughters and husbands and fathers fighting in wars for great causes? This is a microcosm of that same kind of concept, but it is one that is ruled by the small-minded ideas of being rich and I'll be important. If someone takes looks at all of my stuff instead of all that guy's stuff, I'll be more important. When you boil those ideas down and you're not necessarily fighting for the great glory of a piece of ribbon or the freedom of your country, and you start engaging in these uh, office uh, water cooler politics and character assassination that's not based on ideas that move a great idea forward, you'll find yourself in there and you're going to find yourself winning something that's going to be very costly to you. Sigurd Spake. Someone the horde shall ever hold till the destined day shall come. For a time there is when every man shall journey hence to hell. Hey, that gold's always going to be there. 
They print money every single day. They print money. They print so many millions of dollars every day. We it staggers the imagination. All we have to do is step out there and take it. There's a right way to take it, and there's a wrong way to take it. If we're acting at the urging of someone else telling us that we need to do it this way or that way, we might be doing it wrong. If we're moving out there, building ourselves up, becoming a well-rounded individual, centered under the ash, the axis mundi, we might find that the wealth we win will do that great good thing we wish it would do for our families. To go out there and seek fame and fortune by the character assassination of another individual because someone has been whispering into our ear our entire lives. We are finding ourselves fully engrossed in the uninspired human intellect that was Loki's who began all of this. It all ties together in a depth and an astounding manner few people ever take into consideration. Fafnir spake, the fate of the Norns before the headland, thou findest the doom of a fool. In the water shalt drown, if thou row against the wind, all danger is near to death. We face it every day. Who knows what's going to happen when you walk out the front door? Sigurd spake, tell me then, Fafnir, for wise thou art famed, and much thou knowest now, who are the Norns who are helpful in need, and the babe from the mother bring? So now all of a sudden Sigurd's paying attention to him. He's like, hey, wait a minute. And this, this old boy might, he might really know something. Once again, Sigurd stands up and has the courage to say, okay, let me look at all sides of this. Let me pay attention to what's going on here. I'm having second thoughts maybe a little bit. There's some wisdom to be found in this. Of many births, the Norns must be, nor in one race they were, some to the gods, others to elves or kin, and Dvalin's daughters some. Tell me then, so this question and answer scenario is beginning. He's testing the waters to see if maybe he's made a bad decision. And all of a sudden in that question and answer scenario would begin with the Norns, the ones who determine the fate of men. And that question and answer scenario to determine the quality of an individual is something that's repeated throughout the lore again and again to determine if an individual is that well-rounded, well, truly well-centered individual who might understand the flows of energy, how he operates in the world, how he is interconnected with all things. Sigurd spake, tell me, Fafnir, for wise thou art famed, and much thou knowest, how call they the isle where all the gods insert shall, shall sword sweat mingle? Fafnir spake, near it is where all the gods shall seek the play of swords. Be lost breaks when they cross the bridge, and the steeds shall swim in the flood. That is... That's a reference to Ragnarok. That's the, that's fat, when Surt uh, uh, surges forth and he carries the, the bane of branches, the scourge of branches, the fire that's going to burn it all. And the gods shall seek the play of swords where the gods will make that last final stand and stem the tide of the destruction and begin the cycle anew. And the steeds shall swim in the flood. This is the, this is, once again, a reference to the Veluspa, when the sons of men go on the march. The sons of men are the great waves of water that flood across the, the plains, that flood across the mountains, that flood across the earth. That, uh, as I've talked about in the Veluspa, that destruction that's recorded in, recorded that might possibly be the Younger Dryas event. That makes this much older than anyone wants to believe. The fear helm I wore to affright mankind while guarding my gold I lay. My ear seemed I than any man, for a fiercer never I found. So the fear helm surely no man shields when he faces a valiant foe. Oft one finds when the foe he meets that he is not the bravest of all. And that's straight out of the have them all. So instead of developing himself into that well-rounded individual that could stand there, faster has been using a, a front. He's been wearing a mask to keep people away to protect his gold. He's been wearing this horrible looking effigy that keeps people from looking over there, much like the Christian devil. Don't look over there. Uh, but if we start looking at the light bringer, there's some other things that might come to uh, fruition in our lives. <laughs> and that's going to probably piss off every Christian, but it's the same thing with us. We wear a mask most of the time because we might know a lot of things, 
but it's very difficult to withstand the slings and arrows of lesser men who don't want to hear what we have to say. We'll wear a fear helm. We'll put up a big bluff, and I'm going to beat you up, and you can't do this, and you can't do that, and I, this is who I am. When you stand up and take a look at it, is that individual on solid ground? Does that individual really know what they're talking about? Sigurd, the man that stands up and calls it like he sees it and begins that question and answer scenario, begins to see you might wear that mask, but you're not that brave. Fafnir spake, venom I breathed when bright I lay by the hoard my father had. There was none so mighty as dared to meet me in weapons nor wiles that I feared. So it worked for him. He kept that bluff up. He protected it. The, um, like a crotchety old man, I guess. Nobody wants to deal with a guy that's angry all the time. So this is the mask he put on, angry all the time, venom put forth. Who wants to talk with someone who's been around for 60 or 70 years and every single thing they say is some kind of negative nonsense? I hate this and I hate that and I really understand this. You know, I've been red-pilled, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> that's the mask we're talking about. Fafnir thinks it worked for him. Sigurd says, no, when you come up against a real, woman, a, real, a real weapon and a real warrior, you're probably going to find out you're not as tough or as important or that you know what you think you know. <laughs> Fafnir spake, I counsel thee, Sigurd, heed my speech and ride thou homeward hence. The sounding gold, the glow red wealth, and the rings thy vein shall be. So he tells him one more time, you don't want to fool with this. This has ruined my life. And it's probably going to ruin yours too, if it doesn't end it. Sigurd, he's committed. Thy counsel is given, but go I shall to the gold in thy heather hidden, and Fafner thou with death dost fight, lying where hell shall have thee. So Fafner's going to meet that sun facing goddess at this point, and Sigurd tells him, Look, I got it. I want it. It's mine now. Fafner spake, Reagan betrayed me. And thee will betray, us both to death will he bring. So he tells him right there, his life, methinks, must Fafir lose, for the mightier man wast, wast thou. So Reagan had gone to a distance while Sigurd fought. He hid like a coward and came back while Sigurd was wiping the blood from his sword. Reagan said, Hail to thee, Sigurd, thou victory hast, and Fafir in fight hast slain. Of all the men who tread the earth, most fearless art thou, methinks. Blowing smoke up his ass. You've done a great thing. But Sigurd has got some questions now. All of a sudden, he's had that question and answer scenario with Fafnir. He's seen him cower on the deck of the ship. He saw him hide behind the rock. Now, all of a sudden, this wise and fierce in battle and ingenious dwarf doesn't really measure up anymore. Now he begins to see through Reagan's facade as well. Reagan had a mask as well. He, everyone thought he was ingenious and fierce and wise and skilled in magic. Sigurd has seen firsthand that his facade was every bit as ugly as Fafnir's. Unknown it is when all are together, the sons of the glorious gods who bravest born shall seem. Some are valiant who redden no sword in the blood of a foeman's breast. Who has the courage to stand up and not take action based on what someone else tells them. And that's exactly what he's talking about. Who has the courage to stand up and say, you know what? That's not the kind of thing that's going to move my life or my faith forward, and I'm not going to engage in it. That's the valiant who redden no sword in the blood of a foeman's breast. I'm not going to denigrate or take action or vilify some other group of people or individual or aspect or faith or religion because you say so. Who are you? I have not seen you do anything courageous. I have not seen you enjoy success in the world. I have not seen you become something better because of what you believe. So the valiant man is the one that stands up and says, that what you're talking about, these ideas you want me to buy into, these do not further my faith, my idea. They do not strengthen me. They do not embolden me. They do not engender courage or success in my life. That's exactly what he's talking about. 
Reagan spoke, glad art thou, Sigurd, of battle gain, as Graham with grass thou cleanest, my brother fierce and fight has slain, and someone I did myself. So now he's going to take credit for it. This guy's been a coward throughout these whole two stories, and now he's going to take a little credit for it. The only thing he's done is speak the poisons in this in Sigurd's ear that allowed him to take the life of a foe who was not his foe. When you see great political ideologies take forth, take take form, like communism, like Nazis, like like any kind of socialism, like like race based communism, when you see these things take shape, you see these individuals push people towards taking the life of someone else, and then they're going to stand up and take the credit because now all of a sudden they have great wealth. What? That is an age-old and timeless characteristic of deception and the weaving of men's minds that our lore has showed up again in this day and age to protect us from. <laughs> Far didst thou go while Fifnir reddened with blood my blade so keen. With the dragon, with the might of the dragon, my strength I matched, while thou in the heather didst hide. And so it is. Send those foot soldiers forth to do our bidding for whatever reason. While I sit back over here comfortable and enjoy all of the, all the fruits of your endeavors. So we're going to stop right there on 27. At, uh, and, and, and then uh, next week we'll pick up on the uh, Fafnis Ball stanza 27 and we'll continue on into uh, where Sigurd meets Brunhild, because everything that I've talked about so far, what happens next is equally as amazing and wonderful. And I thank you for your time, and I, I really appreciate you all being here today. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, you bet, Brian. man. Thanks, Brian. Have a good night. You too. All right, guys.